I will get us started. So good evening, everyone. Um, when I'm up here, I talk in my sort of declamatory room <laughs> full of four-year-old's voice, so apologies for that in advance. Um, thank you so much for coming. I know that all of you are extremely busy, uh, and it means a lot that you even just showed up here tonight to talk about an issue that's very important. Uh, I want to thank Representative Frank Smyzik for coming out tonight to talk to his constituency. Uh, and so this is the first time um, we're, we're meeting, so it's great to meet you. Um, and uh, with that, I, I wanted just to uh, maybe have us go around quickly and do introductions uh, because a lot of us are uh, here for the first time and um, meeting each other as a, as a group for the first time. So I'm Roxy Myram. I'm the artistic director at Puppet Showplace Theater. Uh, I live in Cambridge and I'm a lifelong Massachusetts resident and a big fan of lots of arts, although primarily now I work as a theater director and puppeteer. Hi, my name is Brenda, and I am the Communications Director here at Puppet Show Place Theatre. I am also a freelance theatre artist. I do costuming and stage direction, mm -hmm. and I'm a teaching artist. I am currently now teaching shadow puppetry through Puppet Show Place Theatre at the Boston Chinatown Neighborhood Center. And about two years ago, I moved to Brookline so that I could live and work in the same community. So one of the coolest things in my life has been to get up in the morning, walk 15 minutes to work, perform a puppet show, <laughs> and then hang out with kids at a puppet theater. So that's kind of my story. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Maria Finnison. Um, I'm on the board here at the Puppet Show Place Theater um, and have taken over as the interim executive director um, in the last few months. Um, I am also a Brookline resident, and I'm very happy to be supporting a uh, local organization that I attended as a child. Uh, hey, I'm Brad. I'm the artist in residence here at the Puppet Show Place, and like Brenda, <coughs> I get to put on puppet shows and teach everyone from, uh, from the littlest kids through college students. Uh, and, and I feel that Puppet Show Place has been pretty much almost more of a home to me than my actual apartment in JP. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I, I love getting to be a part of this community and, and Boston at large and sort of bringing this art form that I'm so passionate about uh, to all these groups around here. Um, let's go, yeah, do you want to I'm yeah. Susan Elport, hi. I'm a Brookline resident. Um, I'm an artist and have have had great opportunities of showing with uh, Brookline Studios Without Walls and uh, several outdoor sites, which I've loved, and I've loved the responsiveness of this community to that. Um, I'm affiliated with the Kingston Gallery downtown in the South End, and um, I have taught art as well to children at the New York Center in Newton, but my full-time job besides creating work is creating English speakers. I'm a, a full-time mm -hmm. teacher of uh, English language learners in the Somerville Public Schools. So this is my night off. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We hope you have fun. <laughs> um, my name is Betty Ann Libby. I'm the founder of Studios Without Walls, and I am a Brookline native. Ooh. <laughs> and I live in Brookline, Ooh. too. I mean, <laughs> Thanks. And anyway, I do not live here continuously, but I moved back a mere 20 six, seven years ago. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then I started the studios out without walls because when I did the open studios, everyone said, hey, I had 400 people, I had 200 people, and I'd say, well, I had 25. <laughs> so because of where I lived, I said, no, this is not working. We gotta do a group thing, and we, so I gathered these sculptors together, and we've gotten 13 grants from the Mass Cultural Council. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And this year we actually got inspired by a TED talk that said, go ask for money. <laughs> so we did it and we asked for money and we got money. Wow. So in addition to the grant, because we have expenses and, mm -hmm. you know. Thank you. We're not making a living at this, but <laughs> the, uh, the parks department love us, but when I said, how about a bucket load of, oh no, we can't do that. <laughs> so, you know, they have their limit. Love has its limits. <laughs> uh, thank you. And I, I do want to say, like, I hope I, I want there to be time for everyone to share uh, experiences. Yeah. Definitely, also in the context of us uh, talking about that. So don't don't save all your spill all your good stories now. But thank you, Betty Ann. Um, do you want to go next? 
Sure. Um, hi, I'm Cheryl Pitts. I am a more recent resident of Brookline about six years ago. And um, I'm at Longwood Towers and I'm involved with the Board of Trustees there and organizing mm -hmm. events for residents. Um, I am, uh, I like to call myself a student of art. I'd love to be able to retire the day job at some point, but uh, not there yet. And um, so I've gotten a little more involved this year with Brookline Open Studios showing my art mm -hmm. for the first time. And it's, an, it's just an amazing organization. And, and um, so kind of slowly we're trying to reach out from where we live into the community and bring, get more involved with things that are going on. We're doing a group venue there and I'd like to get more involved, so this seems like a good place to be to meet more people and find out more about how the Mouse Cultural Council works and how it affects um, arts and Brooklyn. Great. Uh, John and Paul, do you want to go? I'll go. Okay. I'm Paul Vincent Davis, and uh, I have been a professional puppeteer for over 45 years. I was a puppeteer long before that, but I became professional. And uh, uh, see, I've won five international awards, a number of regional awards, and uh, local awards. So, and I have uh, been on um, WGBH television nationally, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I have a and long he lives upstairs. Huh? Um, you live upstairs. Really? Wow. And I live upstairs, mm -hmm. and I am now the retired old guy at the show place. <laughs> <laughs> and helped to found Puppet Show. Yeah. John. Thank you. Um, I'm John Lechner and I'm on the board here at the Pu Puppet Show Place Theater. And I'm also a writer and an illustrator, an animator, and a puppeteer. And I work at a children's software company in Boston called Fable Vision, where we do websites and uh, children's software. And I'm a supporter of the arts. Thank you. Uh, Jill, do you want to go? I'm Jill Carrier. Um, I've been the executive director of PALS Children's Chorus for four years, which was a radical career change for me. My daughter attended a Boston public school that was very under-resourced, that had no arts or anything, and I enrolled her in a children's chorus and fell in love with what I saw in terms of the difference it made in kids' lives and the quality of life for everybody around. Uh, so um, this is work that I love deeply and believe in. Uh, PALS has been in Brookline for almost 25 years. It was started by a Lincoln School parent in response to funding cuts to the arts. Sounds very familiar. We haven't come that far in 25 <laughs> years. Mm -hmm. uh, and she started an incredible uh, organization that um, very quickly got a, a reputation for very high quality um, training in music and performance opportunities. This mm -hmm. was Jody Hill Simpson, if anyone happens to know her. Um, and it still continues to this day. It's grown far beyond Lincoln across Brookline and now neighboring towns. We have 190 kids. Um, the, I have to say, educationally, in terms of performance opportunities, it's really a stellar organization um, that is run on a shoestring, that's one of my missions. Um, in terms of youth development, what it does for kids is extraordinary in terms of confidence and quality of life. What it does for audiences, we sing before thousands of people every year. Um, so I really feel very confident when I say it really enhances the life of people in the greater Boston area. The Mass uh, Cultural Council has been really important. And our gra grant has shrunk year by year since I joined PALS, um, and we are struggling, but um, just having the grant means all the world to us and the support that they give. It's just a wonderful organization that um, we've depended on through the years since almost the beginning of PALS and still depend on even with the grant shrinking. And I would do anything to support them and. Um, any advocacy that they want us to participate in, I, I do gladly because it's it's a phenomenal organization. The, and, and the arts are not the frills. This is when I, I see kids whose lives have been changed by PALS. Kids who grew up in the low-income housing right near Lincoln School, raised by single grandmothers um, under you know really extraordinary challenges. And I see them standing in Jordan Hall singing on From the Top. Mm -hmm. And I, I just say, this is changing kids' lives, and it's not a frill. 
even though with the economy the way it's been, it might seem like one that really can save a kid's life. So the arts are really important. Yeah, well, I just, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. I'm going to go next. Because uh, my name is Laura, and uh, I am the co-founder of the Brookline Symphony Orchestra, and we mm. are in our third season. Um, I'm also a Boston Public School music teacher, and I think often about, um, I work with middle school and high school students and teach instrumental music, and I am thinking about what, what's next. You know, they have this amazing experience in their youth, and what do they do after? And I think adults need just as much support in the arts um, as, as children. Um, so we're really excited about joining into the Brookline art scene through um, our concerts and our outreach concerts, and um, we've been at the First Light Festival, and um, you know uh, we've been working with Peg, and um, the, you know the chocolate extravaganza. It's just been great to to just really become a part of the Brookline community. So thank you. Go ahead. I'm um, Peg O'Connell. I'm an accountant by day, a black and white photographer by night. I've been doing the Brookline Open Studios for 12 or 13 years now. Um, one of my favorite projects is photo now photographing the Brookline Symphony Orchestra. Um, and I think I came tonight just because I, I do the Brookline Symphony Orchestra photo shoots gratis just because I love music. But I think I'm also interested in just learning about funding opportunities. Mm -hmm. I mean, I haven't really researched funding opportunities. I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to go broke, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> Artists and money. It's yeah. a. It's a a large topic for yeah. another evening. <laughs> but yeah. uh, anyway. And I'm Aaron Seidman. Uh, I've been exhibiting in open studios for I think about the same length of time as Peg. And uh, I do I do etching, uh, print I do printmaking and some photography and I recycle uh, styrofoam cups into art. Uh, and uh, during the and my day job, I design, I design websites for, uh, for small businesses and, and nonprofits, and I, for example, maintain the, uh, the Brookline uh, High Alumni uh, site. Uh, and oh, and I, and I'm not a native, but I've been here for over 40 years, so, which is longer than a lot of natives. <laughs> 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 Great. And do you want to briefly introduce yourself as <laughs> what your job is? Uh, I'll talk more about that later. Sure. Sure. Um, sure. Um, my name is Frank Schmeisick, and I uh, moved up here in 1978. Mm -hmm. I lived in Pittsburgh and lived there for almost 30 years. Um, I took a trip to Europe and saw the culture there, the mm -hmm. music, the art. And um, I was I went around Europe for three months. I, I was married and I could afford it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was fabulous. And I realized that Pittsburgh was not the center of the world. And I moved here. Um, but Boston's a little closer. Yeah, I still like the baseball teams and football teams. Um, uh, I'm in my seventh term in the legislature. I'm the chairman of the committee on global warming and climate change. And um, you know, believe it or not, I might be I might be the only state representative, of the state chairman of a committee on global warming and climate change. Wow. And that's just, just a little bit of head, yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and um, as I say I was I was uh, here. I was I was head of the uh, housing authority for ten years and eight years, nine years for the school committee. Mm -hmm. So I've had experience in two towns. I'm in my 14th, well, 12th, 13th year in the legislature. Wow. Seventh term, you know, seventh term. Nice. Well, thank you so much for being here tonight. And again, thank you to everyone here. Um, I want to just briefly kind of frame uh, what is at stake and what we're interested in, in talking about tonight and hearing a little bit more about um, with the Mass Cultural Council. And as we know, there's there's 
many, many issues related to funding and economics and, and the arts, but um, this one in particular as, as citizens, as taxpayers, as participating artists, and as organizations, uh, we all have a stake in what's going on. Um, so funding for the Mass Cultural Council uh, reached its height at, I think, an allocation of $19 million uh, in the current budget that was proposed uh, before um, the recent amendment, uh, it was bringing it down to uh, a 12 million minus, less than $12 million. And uh, in we are hoping that um, at least in the, the next round that we restore it, it would have been 8.5 million, right? Because the 9 million level. And we're uh, hoping that in this next round it is restored to at least $12 million, which is the pre uh, recession level um, of funding and uh, those you know, most of us are not working for organizations that look at line items in the millions of dollars and juggle that around and divide it by the number of the people in the Commonwealth um, but I think all of us probably have a tangible experience of what funding from the Mass Cultural Council is able to do as someone who grew up in Massachusetts my whole life uh, I have a very peculiar but specific memory of going to so many different arts events, whether they were at libraries, whether they were at small theater venues or music venues uh, all throughout Western Massachusetts, whether it was an educational event um, and or, or something that interpreted history. And going through the whole program, I like to read meticulously, and then seeing this logo on the back and I was like, what sort of amazing organization with its little, you know, Starburst logo <laughs> could possibly co be connected to all of these wonderful events that were the best things about being a citizen of Massachusetts? And of course, that was the Mass Cultural Council. Um, and now, as a professional theater artist and administrator, uh, I, of course, have a different relationship with the Mass Cultural Council. Uh, we are very, very grateful to re um, receive the funds that we do. We are a uh, colleague organization. Is that what we figured out it's called? Okay. And uh, cultural investment we're part of the cultural investment portfolio, yes. We're a robust old <coughs> organization. Um, so there's an amount of funding that we receive each year and, and we have an expedited um, application process. Uh, but that funding, as we know, is dependent on how much funding goes to the Mass Cultural Council. So an organization the size of ours really feels it as just a line item every year, whether there is the political will for that number to stay the same or whether it keeps going down. Um, we, as I'm sure many of you do, uh, as an arts organization, get asked to be a public good for the community all the time. People walk in our door and they express a need and a desire for art to be present at events. And that's usually something that uh, this other collaborator or other group is asking us to do for free. And as artists, we are built on being generous. We want nothing more than to share our gifts with the world. Um, and we try to do this as much as possible. Uh, some of you may have been involved with Climate Action Week uh, here in Brookline. I'm sure you were familiar with this. And uh, there was an amazing call to artists that was part of that. And, and we responded to that in um, using art to create visibility about this other very important uh, topic. That's something that we did. Uh, just somehow found time in the schedule on top of everything else going on um, <coughs> and recently and this was thankfully with help from the local cultural council we also brought uh, giant puppets to a community event that happened outside City Hall uh, that was something that was meant to spur uh, the Brookline Village area as a, a wellness district so this was the small business community then coming to us and saying hey we really want to do this thing that will help all of our small businesses can you guys the artists be part of that and we said yes and we f you know found time in the schedule uh, and allocated the resources that we could to make that happen and that's what we want to keep doing uh, we're, we none of us are resentful about our uh, the other people asking us to give as much as we possibly can um, and that's part of why we're 
we, we as citizens and we as artists and we as organizations really want to uh, encourage you and support you and support um, everyone putting their voices together to say we need to maintain and hopefully in the future restore and increase uh, the investment in these cultural activities so we can continue to be generous and we can continue to um, to fund the things that make Massachusetts a great place to live. Um, so that's a, a little bit uh, from the, the big picture and the, the also the puppet showplace perspective. Um, I'm, I'm thankful for you guys uh, sharing some of your stories so far, but I'm wondering if anyone else wants to uh, bring up a, a specific example or talk a little bit more about their connection to uh, what funding from the Mass Cultural Council has allowed you to do so far uh, and um, what you could do if this these additional funds were allocated and either found their way into your organization or your community. So would any of you like to add more to what you were saying? You could come up and take this chair. I feel like I didn't mean to be the center of attention. You got Jill, do you want to talk some more about your experience? Well, one thing we do struggle with is, I mean, we feel like our... Come on up, so everyone can... I, yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> but one thing we, we, we do f feel that we don't... Our, our membership does not reflect the diversity of Rhode mm. Island. It reflects the cultural diversity. It doesn't reflect the socioeconomic diversity. And part of that, it's a complex issue, reaching kids for whom, you know... Um, our programming doesn't necessarily seem like the thing they might want to do, or their parents don't have the means to support them. Mm -hmm. You know, if it is a single parent with two jobs and no car, it, 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 our program takes a lot of commitment. So even though we always say in our literature, no child is turned away for financial reasons, I noticed very soon after coming to PALS that that line wasn't working, it wasn't welcoming enough, mm -hmm. and it it glossed over some pretty profound difficulties in supporting kids staying in our programs. Yeah. Um, and one thing that funding is really critical, because we are a tiny organization too, we're the same thing, when people ask us to do things for free, we want to do them, but we are a staff of three working mm -hmm. unbelievable hours. Like, people would believe the, the, the yeah. hours <laughs> we work. And um, there's just a limit to what we can do, and I feel the biggest um, goal that I have um, is supporting kids who cannot pay the tuition, but also need a lot of support, need us working with their counselors, their teachers. The Lincoln School has been great, Steps to Success has become a partner with us, um, and we, you know, we've used, we have a whole team of people supporting some of these kids. But it takes resources, is what you're talking about. It, it all takes resource. Um, and it's a hidden cost because I think, oh, I'll just drive that kid home myself. Or yeah. I'll just, you know, make sure that kid has a snack. Or, But cumulatively, supporting those kids takes a lot of resource. And, but, and yet, I think it's fundamental to our mission. So that's one big area in which uh, funding makes a huge difference. And that's part of how we've used the Mass Cultural Council uh, funds to support the kids who would not be able to be in PALS otherwise. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. I mean, uh, yeah, uh, you yeah. know, as Brookline is cutting its elementary music in half, mm -hmm. we feel like, oh my gosh, the gap is now really increasing because some parents are going to get private lessons for the kids no matter what. Mm -hmm. It's the, other, the kids who can't afford it. Um, so we see that we have a bigger role that we could be playing, both in supporting the schools and what's left of the music programs, and also um, kind of helping to keep that gap from getting even wider. So that's that's our biggest way in which we would love to have more funding, so we could do what we really believe in. Do you want to talk? Uh, Just briefly, yeah. um, we hold, please, please so chair it up. So it's so short. Um, <laughs> We are an organization of volunteers, uh, and we're very committed to um, creating these opportunities for the 70 people in the orchestra. Um, and we perform three times per year. Um, and so our costs are basically rehearsal space for the 70 people and the, uh, the rental of the hall that we, in which we perform. Um, so the Brookline Commission for the Arts has given us small grants um, in the past that helps us pay for our, our performance um, 
costs. And so we'd like to add a fourth performance. We really feel like they're, um, we're missing out on a population of families, actually. Um, and, and we really think that having this fourth concert will help us reach out to that, that population that we're, that we're not targeting. And, or th we are targeting, that we're, that we're missing, yeah. Do people in the orchestra right now contribute yes. financially? Yes, everybody well? contributes yeah. financially. Um, most of our funding comes from um, private donors, mm -hmm. friends and family of the orchestra, and people who, we, who we've touched in the community. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think that theme is, is and that arrangement is true for many arts organizations where mm -hmm. um, it's not about substituting public funding and private funding. Um, they do different things. The need for private funding is always there, but the need mm -hmm. for public funding is also there. And mm -hmm. diminishing any of those line items diminishes capacity to make an impact as artists and performers and to give those gifts again. Yeah, and getting uh, funding from the um, the Brookline Commission of the Arts, mm -hmm. especially if we were to get uh, be able to get a fourth concert, would help bring in more private found, uh, funding if we could reach more people. The more people we reach, then the more sustainable we'll be. Can I have a question? Yeah. So, because the Mass Cultural Council is going to cut back with their funds, does that mean the Brookline Commission is going to get less? As, as far as I know, yes. So the Mass Cultural Council has that there's a. a large line item that's um, allocated uh, for them through the year that then funds the different cultural councils um, and within the MCC there's also different tracks of funding so there's the ones that um, some of our organizations receive directly but there's also ones that require a more aggressive granting process like uh, the Cultural Facilities Fund grant. And that's one where, um, you, I mean, I love Puppet Show Place. Uh, w the building needs work. And, um, you know, that's an enormous investment. It's one that creates jobs for architects and contractors and, and the, those funds that come through us as an arts organization stay in the community and um, create other jobs. But it's an enormous investment to take on as part of our operating costs. So the MCC does have um, a, lot, a, a program where, where organizations can apply uh, for that funding. However, that's one where the budget cuts are felt most directly because when you write in and they say everything was in order and we would have loved to fund this, but we have only so much funding this year and it's less than last year. Uh, then you know we have leaky ceilings and and broken floors, uh, and that's you know a direct <laughs> a you direct about response. Kickstarter? Hmm? Have you thought about Kickstarter? Well, yes, and I think that's the idea is that there are there are, all of us are tapping out all the sources of funding that are possible, and I think the the move towards funding innovation is really important, but it's not a substitute. It's, it's not there to replace funding from the Cultural Council. That funding needs to be stabilized. Mm -hmm. And then from there, hopefully we're recruiting more sources of funding or innovating and becoming more efficient in order to achieve more, um, not making the work that we do in the impact mm -hmm. smaller. Um, the is, is, is there, would you like to talk more about uh, your experience with, with the Cultural Council Fund? Well, our grant was double when we first started. Mm. And then, yeah. yeah. By the numbers. Yeah. Hi, Nora, come on in, please. It's dwindled. I'm going to uh, make you come up and talk in a second. I, so. did, notice, <laughs> I did notice that not all the, um, the grants that they gave out were to Brookline mm -hmm. organizations. Right. But hopefully, to, I think their so criteria is projects in Brookline. So, um, but they get vastly more applicants than they can fund. Um, and the grants, they kind of cut them. Yeah. I mean, maybe they cut them back and gave more or something. Yeah. I don't know what they're thinking of because of that. They're dividing a very small pie, as far as mm -hmm. we can tell. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And I guess that we can't count on the town if they're cutting back the music and they don't have that. Um, 
Nora, can I put you on the spot right in coming in? Great, come on. <laughs> so Nora Dooley is uh, the co-founder of Mass Mouth um, and a Brookline resident. Is this the spot? Yes. You yeah, on? that's the spot. You can go in the spot. Nora's a good a good storyteller. So, um, and we we were just uh, introducing ourselves and then also talking about what the Mass uh, Cultural Council enables us to do and if it were better funded, what more it might enable us to do. So. Um, we started in 2008, and in 2009 we applied for our first Mass Cultural Council grant uh, through Cambridge Arts Council because we had a, an address there. We didn't yet have an audience, uh, an office, or an address. So as an entity, and um, that first uh, grant allowed. Uh, and the thing is that they're small, and they hardly cover any <coughs> part of what if we were all paid or you know the, the labor that goes into it. Blah blah blah. But just that little bit of seed money means that you've been vetted by a group of people who know enough about what you're doing that if you go to someone and say, well, look, we have this local cultural council grant that's the Mass Cultural Council has given us this, and we would like to do, and what we were doing was we do a series of three story slams that had never been done yet in the city of Cambridge, so they're first story slams in the city of Cambridge, and we partnered with CCTV because we could say to CCTV, hey, we have a local cultural council grant, and mm -hmm. they said, oh, okay, eyes open. And they said, mm, that's interesting, so you're serious, and you're going to raise the money, because they're always matching grants. So they create collaborations, and they create um, investment in the arts outside of the grants themselves, always. That's how they're set up. So for us, it was, it was really important that we were able to establish ourselves as a group that could do something, and we always do 20 times as much as anyone else would do. Maybe Papa Chopin but we always do like. I think everyone in the room does. Yeah, well, amplified effect. But we do yeah. like a, you know an amazing amount for this little piddling bit of money because it's a chance to show what we can do. Mm -hmm. So that was like our first one, and then um, are we talking about just state support or mass cultural council? You can do state support too. Mostly we're focused on mass cultural council, but. But, you do uh, any age? Or well, the Mass no, Cultural so. Council, I mean, I have, I have, um, I, I love them to death, and I have a huge beef with them about their STARS residency program. I don't know if you want to talk about those things, but they have money for residencies and program and uh, schools, and they, because they're underfunded, Mass Cultural Council, instead of vetting the people who apply for it, they do it first come, first serve. And these mm -hmm. grants, in the last three years, we have this wonderful program for high school students that has been supported throughout the Commonwealth for Worcester's, um, Newburyport, Revere, Lynn, all these different local cultural councils. We're in high schools and we teach students to tell their stories. We teach them to tell a three minute personal <coughs> narrative that they can use for in a college interview, in a job interview, or as a basis of a college application essay. And it's a, a very valuable thing for them to learn how to do. It covers all the ELA frameworks, by the way. But We've gotten money from the Mass Cultural mm -hmm. Council, and again, that's the kind of thing that gives us the leverage to get some other money. Mm -hmm. But the STARS residency thing, because the Mass Cultural Council doesn't have the money to uh, vet the, the grants, they just do it first come, first serve. So the first year, we found out about it, we were almost ready to do it in, we, we got our thing in two weeks after the thing opened, and there was no, there was no deadline, it was open. And they said, all oh, the money's gone, sorry, try it next year. Okay, so next year, we got all our stuff ready, and we got it in the day after. And they said, oh, no money left, try it next time. So this year, we said, okay, now that's all right. all right. We got this, we know how to do this now. We had everything ready that day, and it opened at nine o'clock, and there was one school that hadn't answered one question. And it took us until, so I called them at one o'clock and said, so I'm just wondering, I asked them one question. She said, and you better get your grant in soon because it's uh, money's almost gone again. Now, you had to be kidding. And we got our stuff in at three o'clock and we were too late. Aww. So, but that's, an, uh, that's a problem of underfunding. They do not have the staff they have, so what are they going to do? They have this money to give to people to do good work. So I guess they've made the decision to give the most people the more money to do the good work. But it's if with better funding, they would be able to vet the grant so that, you know, I don't know what they're giving it to. So I said, so I'm buying balloon animals with children, you know, and that's a literacy project. And we're doing this great thing with high school students, and they get there first. 
I'm not hiding. No, 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 not to rape balloon animals. I love, <laughs> <laughs> we do love, I love a balloon animal, but it's done right. Uh, ah, it's it's working right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What's really challenging about the STAR grant is that the Puppet Show Place Theater cannot apply for the grant. We have to apply with a partnership with a school. And the school has to be the one who applies. Exactly. And they have certain numbers that no one else can access except them. Except and them. that's what was our problem. Right. One school wanted it, but they didn't fill in that part. And you can call up a high school and say, please do this for me. Would you? Pretty please. You're on top. You can say whatever you want. It's not going to happen until they're ready to do it. And if they don't do it, you're... Well, and that's part of, for all of us, about funding it, it administrators. I mean, I think all of us who have applied for grants know that funding operations and administration is not the sexy thing to be funding. You want to be funding the cutting edge of art and the new innovative project. But making art is a challenging process and making art collaboratively, making art that's relevant to public institutions, especially very complicated ones like public schools. Uh, it takes work and it takes dotting your I's and crossing your T's and um, that when sustaining funding is cut that's the part we we let administrators go we let staff people go we hire people who are less well trained um, and it it's this overall impact on the arts community where that's not the impact we're looking for. We're looking for the impact of investment, which leads to excellence, which leads to this public good being available for more people in our public institutions. Um, so thank you, Nora, for sharing. I would just add that our yeah. biggest challenge is we don't have any access to that kind of operational grant. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I work for free, 18 hours a day, seven days a week, mm -hmm. and I cannot continue to do that. Mm -hmm. I've done it for three and a half years. Mm -hmm. I just can't continue to do it. I have to make some money. Mm -hmm. And so I would have to figure out how to cut back my time doing this really great work yeah. because we don't, we're not operational. That yeah. other stuff is the not there. Yeah. So thank you. So um, with all of these stories from very uh, diverse organizations, I think, again, it's great that people are coming together in support of this. And it's great uh, that recently Representative Smizek has been part of a um, an amendment to, or co-sponsored an amendment to help restore some of this funding, um, which is about the extent that I know of the politics around this at the moment, but is it next week that a, a vote will be taken on the budget for next year? Um, so with that in mind and knowing that we are here uh, tonight as uh, citizens and people re ready to help um, this cause and do whatever we can. Uh, we'd love to hear from you about um, what what's going on at the state house and your perspective from where you stand and what we can do to help and um, and any other hurdles that we have going forward. So I invite you to the grand <laughs> stool in front of the red curtains. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. That's a <laughs> well, the legislature is a complicated situation. Uh, let me let me explain it one way. Um, we, we're looking at a real major battle in, in uh, federal government. The, the, um, the real re Republican uh, uh, conservatives and the some of the conservatives in the Democratic Party uh, want to make government smaller. And that's the big battle. Uh, we're cutting back on things and uh, nobody wants to pay taxes. Um, I'm not sure where people think the money's uh, gonna go, but they don't necessarily think it goes to the best things. And um, Massachusetts has been actually you know, big liberal Massachusetts has been doing that kind of policy for the last 10 or 12 years. Uh, we've cut about three billion dollars from our budget. And that means there are a lot of, a lot of worthy people, worthy organizations, things like the elderly people who have, uh, don't have the care they, they can use in their homes and rather they have to go to nursing homes which is a stupid thing because mm -hmm. it costs more money for everybody 
Uh, it's uh, mentally ill. It's um, every anyone you can think of that has a need for government to help them. They've been cut back. And this year, it looks like um, it was, it's worse than what you said. It's, mm. the, the bill says that we're going to ra uh, raise, we want to raise the money from five million to 12 million, back to 12 million, which I guess what it mm. was. But apparently we lowered it to five to million. Five, wow. um, this this is very frustrating. Um, uh, there's a coalition between the. We have more Republicans than we used to have. We have about 32 mm -hmm. out of 160. Only four in the le in the Senate out of uh, 60. Uh, but there are a lot of conservative anti-tax Democrats in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you all know some of them. Uh, and that's, it's very hard. Now, the governor this year came out with a $1.9 billion uh, budget for transportation and for um, schools. Mm -hmm. It was going to be for higher ed and for some for, for uh, K through 12 and also uh, early in. It's, it's absolutely needed. It's important. Um, our, the way that we get, we usually have three budgets. We have the governor's budget. He gives it out in April, in, uh, excuse me, January. Then the uh, House comes out with their budget. The House deals with money first. Uh, they, they, the only way you can get money into the budget is through the House first. And then the Senate comes out with their budget a few weeks later. Well, the governor came out with a $1.9 billion budget. The House came out with a $500 million budget. The Senate came out with an $800 million budget. <coughs> now, let me go back a second. I, I was, um, I, I certainly liked the amount of money that the governor wanted. I wasn't crazy about how he was doing it. I wasn't crazy about some of the exemptions that hurt middle class and low income people in his bill. But I didn't want us to be the uh, the uh, the feds. I mean, we, there, nobody's talking to each other in the feds. Mm. And the way government works is you have to negotiate. Um, the speaker was getting a lot of. of people telling him that nobody will support uh, taxes, which I believe is not true, especially if you tell people what you're going to give it to them for. Uh, the governor took a big chunk. That's more than we've raised taxes in, in any time since I've been there. And, and there were a lot of people who didn't support that. We didn't have a, we didn't have a majority in the House. But we, it was important that we get our plan out so that we can discuss this. Uh, as I said, you, we don't want to be like the feds and nobody discusses it and nobody reaches agreement. Uh, I got a lot of people upset with me because I voted for our budget because I wanted our budget to get out. Uh, if we had nothing, we would have had no budget. So how do we talk? <laughs> and. Um, the Senate came out with their budget. They said they came out with 800 million. Now, um, we are going to be negotiating. Well, the, the, the House will come out with the, their their member. We'll be negotiating with our, within ourselves to to get more money in that budget. That's what the amendments are. Mm. And. Uh, they always leave some that they they give to 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 worthy mm. people like uh, hopefully that it would be the cultural council. Uh, but we can never tell, and there's too many items that aren't funded. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure how it's all going to work out. We're going to have to raise taxes. Um, 
it's going to be hard to raise the income tax, mm -hmm. but I think that would probably be the fairest. Uh, we're going to do a small gas tax right now. That could change. I don't know. Just three cents. Um, we're going to make some changes uh, in other areas. Uh, the governor wants to cut the sales tax. I don't want to cut the sales tax. Uh, we just we just raised it a couple of years ago. And it looks stupid to do that. And um, there are problems with the sales tax, but our sales tax, as compared to most of the others in the country, is is fairer because there are a lot of things that are left out of our sales tax. So um, that's one issue that we're going to have to deal with. The other is where do we get the rest of the money? Um, the Senate came up with this plan, found this uh, source of funding. I honestly, I'm sorry, I don't understand it totally, but it's a it's a it's a fund that was used for sewers or something like that, mm. and they found that it wasn't being used, and they they found that it, they could therefore use that to go up to 800 million in their budget. We'll see if that's kosher or not. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but that's the negotiations will then start now. And they probably will, will end in June. That's when they usually end. My, my goal in voting yes for our budget was that now the governor and the Senate will have to negotiate this, sit down and talk. And we're starting, we're just starting. The, the first part, the uh, the schools and the uh, transportation, uh, I think, are the highest priorities that we probably have in the in this uh, state. And they were they weren't the whole budget though. Mm -hmm. They were they were just starting. That was kind of the first step. So now we're going to finish our budget and, and at the end of the next week, and we'll see how far we've been able to go. Hopefully it'll be at least the 800 to maybe 900, I don't know. Uh, but that's, that certainly will be enough to help the transportation uh, not raise fares, uh, find some new cars, to do some things to make it work better. Um, a lot of people are afraid of giving that 1.9 billion because they're afraid that 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 money will will go to something else later on because it's there. Mm -hmm. They'd rather do things in the next couple of years while people are still around who pass these bills. Mm -hmm. So there's an argument to that, and that's uh, it's not a bad argument. But uh, the, the T needs so much; we've neglected it for so long. Mm -hmm. We need early education. The kids in higher in higher ed are uh, it's too expensive to go to college. We need help. Mm -hmm. In the K through 12 schools, we're supposed to get by last year or the year before, 17 and a half percent of their budget uh, paid for by the state. Uh, that was the goal to make all the schools better. Well, some of the schools they, they go by which schools can uh, have the the lowest incomes. And those schools get the money first, and that's what's happened. And schools like Brookline, which are facing closing programs and laying teachers off and lots of things, um, they still have about 14 or 15 percent. So I have an I have an amendment in to raise that to 17 and a half percent for everybody. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of people on that amendment. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Basically, that story is just telling you it's a very hard year. And um, a lot depends on the leadership. Our governor, uh, or excuse me, our governor wants to, to do, go in the right direction. I think it's, we should be doing, uh, the speaker is listening too much to the anti-tax people. And uh, the Senate president and the Senate is, uh, very reluctant to raise taxes too. Uh, so well, well, I think knowing that um, what 
would mean a lot to us in this constituency is to um, know that as you pursue all these different priorities <coughs> and pursue negotiations, uh, that one role that you're playing is, in addition to co-sponsoring the amendment, um, that you can talk to, it's DeLeo and Dempsey? Dempsey, Dempsey is the Dempsey head is of Ways and Means. Means. He's the one who's responsible for getting the budget together in mm -hmm. the final budget. Yeah, so in speaking to him and, and uh, House Speaker, right, DeLeo, um, and tell and, and encourage them um, that the, about the things that you've heard here tonight, that the, the arts are not nice, they're necessary, and that uh, there are many people throughout the Commonwealth who um, are affected by this investment uh, and as you said, there are lots of worthy causes, and all of us, I'm sure, have connections as citizens back to all of those causes uh, as well. And, um, but on, on this particular issue, as artists, we know that we've gone on the chopping block first a lot. And now is the time when we want to say, look, you've got to stop somewhere, and Massachusetts needs to keep making this investment. Uh, where it was before in a slow <laughs> a slow path to restoring that investment in our art. Well, it, it, it sure is, and it, it's a uh, way for, for a lot of communities to, to succeed uh, and bring other people into, bring people into their community without the, the, the art and the uh, social services, excuse me, the uh, the uh, music and the uh, other programs, uh, people won't, aren't as excited to live in the, in yeah. the place. And they, they are excited if they're there. Yeah. I, I think that connection is even stronger, is that the people who innovate, the people who start new companies, the people who are technological innovators and economic innovators are people who've been exposed to these arts, to creative things. I think they fuel each other in a really direct way that's easy to overlook. Yeah. That for people to think creatively in those ways, they need to be exposed to creative thinking, especially at a young age. And I think it fuels the economy when people and children have access to all this. I sure, it um, brings people here, just like yeah. the schools do. Right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, what, what part of the program that we have is that we, um, we raised uh, $5,000 in prizes for our high school students each year. We have a regional story slam. and. What that means is uh, for one of the students who won, he was a junior when he won, and this January his mother picked up the $1,000 check that he won. He has uh, mild uh, Asperger's and um, was a great storyteller, not a very successful student. He had gotten into Curry College, had no money, his parents could not even begin to figure that out, like how they would spend $50,000 a year or more. But he took his $1,000 check and paid for his you know, January tuition for an entire semester. Mm -hmm. So this is an arts program that rents the Coolidge Corner Theater for $2,000 last night. So oh that's $2,000 going into the mm -hmm. Coolidge Corner Theater. And we have all of the people come, and we raised mm -hmm. $800 for the One Boston Fund last yep. night. And we would not be able to do these things mm -hmm. without the support. <coughs> so it's not just, as, yeah. as Roxy was saying, it's not just nice, and maybe it would be helpful for um, uh, someone like you who has to defend your stand, if you could say, these are some of the concrete things that happen. It's not, it's not and, and not to denigrate what you're saying, but to just say that's a very future-looking, and, and I would like politicians to be future-looking and think about things like that, but we live in a state where didn't someone give us back, like each one of us got back $65 because there was a, um, what's the opposite of a deficit? Uh, surplus. There was a surplus, and some knucklehead gave us each $65 back. That doesn't even buy you one tire if your streets are full of potholes. <laughs> who is thinking here? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm not a politician, I'm an artist, but for God's sakes, who's thinking here? <laughs> it doesn't even buy you one goddamn tire. Yeah, yeah. People, yeah. all yeah. of them, you know? I, I agree with you 100%, I, I control that. <laughs> yeah. no, I, no, I understand, but I'm just saying that that's, yeah. but those are the kinds of things that the arts do. You know, we came, we, we have a collaboration with Public show place theater, so we bring people in here, and they are able to sell. Um, yeah. There, they sell fresh. I mean, not really yeah. money, but but it's just like we can collaborate and make money and mm -hmm. generate eco economic mm -hmm. activity. Mm -hmm. Where the, we are. The real the argument I hear all the time now is 
we're just getting over a recession and we can't afford to spend money. I don't know if that's true or not. It seems to me that if you spend the money, you can help with the recession. Yeah, and also that the, the uh, I just read an article that, that I think I can find it, that the main um, economic report that all of this sequester blah 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 is based on all this right wing stuff rhetoric is based on is based on some very serious mistakes in an Excel formula. Oh yeah, I read yeah. that. Did you read yeah, that? Right. That's right. It's 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 all wrong. Not only not only is it bad for everybody, but it's actually mathematically BS too. I just wanted to say that, first of all, in general, I'm really disappointed at what I consider to be the timidity of the legislature on this education transportation. I mean, I feel like we're eating our seed corn. Um, and, you know, I was thinking, I, I just got back uh, a small refund from my Massachusetts income tax. I'm thinking, I'd happily forgo this for, the, for, for what I get out of, out of it. I mean, there. Uh, uh, and in terms of the arts, uh, I'm fortunate in that I personally don't need a grant, but I need the art. Uh, and I'm active, in, I, I am active in the Brookline Community Aging Network, which, uh, where that's, that's an important, important component. Uh, and although, you know, I, I make contribution to arts organizations, but I, you know, I can't fund. I can't fund the way that this the state can or the federal government. Well, I think the arts um, have not done a great job of organizing, working together, and making the legislature and the governor understand what the needs are. I don't think the governor. I didn't look at his plan for regard to, regarding uh, cultural. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was that yeah. that good. So there are there are uh, in my, the people who come to me are the environmentalists. Mm -hmm. uh, they're organized. They, mm -hmm. You know, they help me understand why uh, what they want is important. And uh, I think that has to start again in the. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, hopefully this is a step towards that, and, and some of us have also become involved in a, a nascent group in Brookline called the Consortium for the Arts in Brookline, which at, at COFAB, um, but our, our initial impetus in that was, was really just let's work together, let's meet each other, and this is one of our first uh, times turning that energy and focus towards activism that's, that is relevant to all of us um, as citizens and as artists and arts organizations. So uh, we hope to continue that and turn it into a, a more consistent voice uh, expressing the, the value of the arts to our community. And you, you shouldn't yeah. you shouldn't just stick to Brookline. Yeah. Uh, you, you your reps here are okay. But I, I think you, you have to make real uh, work with other cities and towns yeah. and uh, make yourselves be heard. Yeah. Well, Roxy, you heard of this was organized through Mass Creative, right? Yeah. Which is sort of a newly formed mm -hmm. advocacy organization. Yeah. Yes, and, um, and I'm happy to pass on more information about uh, Mass Creative. And, and there are, there are uh, perhaps several arts advocacy groups, but when, I don't know if any of you get the kind of lots of things in your inbox that say, the art funding is about to get cut, please do something, and then say, oh, but I'm supposed to do 800 things today, which is true, but please respond to those calls because it does make a difference. Um, in the past week, there were uh, over a thousand messages sent to representatives, um, which caused there to be, is it more than 90 or more than 100 co-sponsors? I can't tell. I can't tell. There's can't number, count. This is the number of co-sponsors of Corey Atkins's amendment that, that uh, restored, is it something that like wants to restore, million, yeah. The, yeah, funding to the $12 million yeah. level. Um, and she she's the chair of the, what is her committee, the arts? Uh, it's arts not culture, culture committee. It's not arts. And, it might be arts and, arts and culture. I, I'm not committee. sure, but so that's Corey Atkins. That to you. Um, but it sounds like the the people who need convincing 
are um, the speaker, the governor? Are, are there other individuals who who could use a letter from any of the fine folks in this room? Or well, it's more important that they come from their... Their constituents. Yeah. Right. I also wonder, though, if things... I mean, we all take for granted that the arts are important. We know it to our core that this is essential to who we are and what we want for our community. And even people are saying now, oh, the arts are important for kids academically. There's all this research that shows mm -hmm. the kids it's who engage in the arts. It's all bogus. But, yeah, <laughs> but, but until you give, Sorry. I'm just wondering if what legislators really need are numbers. I mean, for us, that's not what we think about. But like, because I, I walked into a school that had a big banner that said arts are academic. You know, so it's not just math, it's not just language arts, it's not just history. Arts are also academic. But the arts were being cut at that very moment because deep down people don't really believe it intellectually. You know, mm -hmm. us in the field, we know it because we see what it does for people. But I almost feel like until researchers, you know, yeah. the Longwood Medical so Area show their brain scans and slap them on legislators' desks and say, look, test scores went up. 30% for the kids who were doing, you know, I, I'm just, I have to wonder that because people say these things, but they don't really believe them, and that's why they're the first things cut. Susan, what were you? Hi, yeah, I'm Susan, Susan Lester. I live in Brookline. I'm a pediatrician. I'm on the board of the Brookline Music School and founding member of, of COFAB. Um, and I just wanted to really echo that um, and also say not every student is going to. Um, go into math and go into science. There are many students in this state who are going to use their art as their way of advancing their education and being successful contributing you know, citizens uh, through their art or through their arts education. So you know, I think it's a very false dichotomy to say you're either academic or you're an artist. Um, the other two things, I know these are very obvious, but I just have to say that arts are a marker of civilization. <laughs> and that if society doesn't have arts, it is on. It, it it will decline. I mean, that is what makes us, you know, elevate ourselves and all. If you just look at the response to the Boston Marathon bombings, it included music. It included, a, 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 as a comforting measure, as a way to understand this. So, um, and the final thing is, uh, just in terms of you know the no tax people. I I mean, I pay a lot in taxes, uh, and I wish I didn't. But um, if you don't pay taxes. Your town, your state, where you live, ends up like a, it, it's godforsaken. You know these places, these like remote areas of Afghanistan. I mean, it, it's chaos if you don't have taxes. So I, I think to have people stick to their guns about no taxes and think, you know, that, then it's just mayhem if there aren't the basic services in place. Um, so I, I just felt like I had to say that. And finally, one of the guitar teachers at the Brooklyn Music School mm -hmm. did want me to read something to you. If you have just one minute. Uh, Representative Smithick, I've been teaching. Smithick. Smithick, sorry. That's right. I see your, your name all over town for years. Okay, you were Rhymes. Mm -hmm. Sorry, okay. I should have written Rhymes with Isaac. Yeah. Okay, all right, I like that. That's like the bakery in Brookline is Athens, not Athens. Right. Rhymes with Nathan. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've been teaching guitar at Brookline Music School, Brookline's oldest and largest cultural institution for seven years. I'm chair of the guitar department, founder of Gitober. You can imagine what that is. It's the month of October dedicated to guitars. And musician in residence at the Puppet Showplace Theater. The arts and arts education are crucial for Brookline. They help develop, challenge, and expand the young minds of our town's children. Arts-based institutions like Brookline Music School and Puppet Showplace Theater focus on cultivating a rich and meaningful environment that benefits society at large and generations to come. Funding, funding from the Mass Cultural Council helps immensely with the passionate people and projects that BMS and PST provide to the community. Thank you. Uh, thank you for supporting this meeting and restoring MCC's budget. I wish I could be there in person. And that's from Brendan Burns. Thank you. I, you know, I was, I was, I told you I was on the school committee for nine years. The thing I was known for was saving instrumental music. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm hearing you how that it's in danger. Bill, Bill Lupini always says, no, no, well, I'm not cutting instrumental music, like, because I was the one who was, who was there. <laughs> but uh, I know it's not true, and, and the, uh, the other, uh, uh, not instrumental, uh, general voices. Yeah. Vocal, no. No, uh, general, general. orchestral. No. 
Oh, uh, singing. Coral. 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 Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Coral music is, is, is suffering a little from Brookline schools, and um, that's not good. Well, the and schools might have to turn to BMS for help. But a place like BMS, you know, maybe if we had a little grant from Mass Cultural, we'd have extra teachers we could help out in the school system. But you know, I understand. Right. That's, that's right. There's and a chain reaction. The, the best way to do it is within the school system, I think. And you know, I don't have anything against Brooklyn, uh, Brooklyn music. No, I, you're yeah. right. But if they can't, the, right. the schools. Right now, it's such a frustrating time for me to look at what we're doing in schools with the charters. Not that I'm against charters, but they're focusing on things like tests, and they're not focusing on music. They're not focusing on extra things that we always have had in the Brookline schools and Newton schools and some of the other best schools in the state. And the difference between those schools and uh, the schools that are failing are resources and curriculum and good teachers and that's that's the problem. And it's not it's not it, it's not privatizing all the public schools. Uh, so it's very, very frustrating because uh, it's happening everywhere. And I wish we could do something more about that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you know about that school in uh, Boston that I had to read about in The Guardian from the UK that fired all their security guards and hired art teachers? Yeah. Where is that? It's in this, it's the Josiah, uh, Josiah Quincy School oh, in yeah. Chinatown. That's one of the Why don't we hear about it? Because the corporate charter movement has totally driven the conversation around education in everywhere and here too. So I, my husband sent it to me because he reads The Guardian. I get it in an email that a school in Boston fires the security guards because it was so much money and gives everybody visual art training and music and they have a great school. This is the kind of thing that if you could say from the floor of the House of Representatives, I mean, I'll come and say it, but you <laughs> say it. But if you say it, it makes a difference. But you, people don't know about it because our our media is just so supine and sold and, and just ridiculous. The days of yellow journalism never look so yellow as they do now. It's ridiculous. It's just that they're very good at not. I mean, or people are less sophisticated at reading things and going, oh, this looks like an advertisement. This is not. This is what is an edutisement or whatever the hell they call it. Isn't it? Editorial. So well, you don't, you didn't, did anyone know that? No. No one no. knows you that. No. Okay, look we, it up, we Google teach it. At JQES, so they're teaching their, Brenda teaches their after school teaching program. A, an after school program. And they've through the Boston Chinatown trip. Neighborhood Center. Mm -hmm. And they, they applied for grant funding mm -hmm. that it allows us to, to serve this community in that way through an mm -hmm. after school program. Yeah. So and what you're talking about is a, is somewhat similar but also different in that it's allowing the teachers who are working during the day to incorporate arts education into when the kids are at the school during and, the day. And kids know what's important. I've taught after school for a long time and that's why we did this high school program. I said, I'm not doing this at after school, right. at so enrichment. Different. This is in the curriculum or it's not. Either it's important or it's not. And kids know if it's important. And if you're in the curriculum, they, if it's during the school day, they know it's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, and that's, I, I think, um, I want us to maybe conclude the official part of this meeting, although everyone is welcome to stay here and have some more grapes. Um, bought at Brookline Local Businesses. Uh, <laughs> but I, I a lot of times the conversation about arts funding as it has tonight sometimes goes back to you know where it's a little more comfortable to make the pitch where it's about public schooling and uh, other things um i just i i know and share uh the feeling that it is challenging to just say the arts for themselves are important and worth funding and that is not the thing that should go to the top of the list for the the chopping block uh, when we're looking at the budget and we as taxpayers and we as other people want that to be funded and um, this is you know there's a lot of fronts of activism that again if we stay organized as a constituency I hope we can 
make a bigger impact, one that we know will benefit and be valuable to the citizens around here. So I, I want to thank you for, for coming tonight. I want to thank you for your work uh, so far and doing all the work that we've, we've learned tonight that you've done over the many years of uh, public service. Um, I hope uh, that as these conversations and negotiations go forward, uh, we can have your commitment to stay as a champion of this cause because it is very important to us. Here. Thank you so much. Thank you.